and we are recording episode 653 with Dr. Matthias Desmond, Dr. Robert Malone, who's not only the inventor of the mRNA vaccine, but is also the inventor of uh, mass formation psychosis, apparently. And Dr. <laughs> McCullough should be joining us any second. But you guys were just saying it's perfect because Malone is is taking all the flack and Dr. Desmet's kind of sitting back there just watching you take the hit, take the heat, right? <laughs> Absolutely insane. Well, and, and, and Google is generating an enormous uh, reservoir of data, which Matthias and his graduate students are going to be able to data mine for the next decade. Yes, yes, Basically yes. validating Matthias's thinking. They can do research for the next, for the next 20 years on these data. I, I, I was thinking about that the last couple of days, you know, I, I did a, I did aquatic toxicology research in college, not because I was interested in it, but because it helped me get into medical school. And I remember thinking how, or remembering how excited uh, my professor was that she got this published. And she was like, you know, no one ever recognizes the names of things. And I was just thinking yesterday, I was like, Dr. Matias, this has to be like the, this is like the kid playing baseball in his backyard, pretending he's hitting the grand slam. Like you are, your, your hypothesis is, is trending more than any celebrity is right now. But because Dr. Malone's been on here and because he was just on Joe Rogan and now the whole world knows him even more. And when Dr. McCullough joins us, he's been on here before everyone knows who he is. Dr. Desmet, please introduce yourself. Well, um, I am a, a professor in clinical psychology uh, at Ghent University in Belgium. Um, it goes without saying that I speak on my own behalf, always not on the behalf of the university. Uh, I don't see why I would talk in, on behalf of an, of an institution, but anyway, it's good to mention, I think. So, but I'm a professor in clinical psychology in a, a, at the University of Ghent, Belgium. I also have a master's degree in statistics. Uh, I don't call myself a statistician because for me, a statistician is someone who is involved in statistics uh, day in, day out. And uh, that was only the case uh, in the first four years in, of my academic career. And later on, I focused more on uh, personality structures and the way that the personality structures were influenced by the people around them and by the groups people belong to. Um, and um, so a part of my research, research was on personality structures and the interaction uh, with the interpersonal um, uh, contexts. Uh, and then um, uh, I also did a lot of psychotherapy research and uh, I lectured on a, on a mass formation on, on no group dynamics, actually, uh, at Ghent University. And uh, one of these group dynamics is, is mass formation, which uh, uh, a theory which can be applied to, uh, to the corona crisis, I think. Um, so that's about what I do, I think. Uh, I also have a clinical practice as a psychotherapist. Uh, here in Belgium, uh, besides my uh, academic work, so uh, and and Dr. Desmet's now been initiated into the club of people who I harass to get on here and sending emails and calls and nonstop. Um, as Dr. Malone's smiling because he knows all too well. Uh, Dr. McCullough just texted me. He'll he'll be here in about ten minutes. He's on he's on TV right now, so he'll be here. Um, but Dr. Malone, could you kind of go over for everyone listening? what exactly this is because you and dr mccullough both talked about it on joe rogan and you both kind of brought up you know the it's the thirty thousand foot view it's what's going on right you introduce this problem you separate everyone you cause uh endless stress and fear and then much like uh much like when you're trying to make a bed and or much like when you're trying to pack a bag i was just in the airport for two days and you're trying to get everything towards the end and all the air bubbles up in one spot and it's about to explode it kind of seems like that's the mass formation psychosis. And then what you can do as a leader or a, a Fuhrer is you can take that one little spot and go, now, what do I want to happen? So Dr. Malone, could you kind of discuss the importance of this? And uh, if you want all the flack you're catching is now uh, Dr. Malone, far right conspiracy theorist uh, claims that United States is a mass formation psychosis, which I have just been laughing at for the last couple of days. Okay. First off, um, just so we're clear, explicitly clear to the audience, this is not my, my work intellectually or academically. I am a student of Matthias Desmet. I have carefully listened to multiple podcasts that he has done. I, I have absorbed it to the best of my ability, but um, 
I am, I am a student learning at the feet of the master on this topic area. You're asking me to summarize just as you just summarized my understanding. Yes. And I look forward to learning more during this podcast. Okay? Yes. So very humble position um, and, and very grateful for the teaching I've received from Matthias through his various podcasts. And I think we may have spoken once in person. Um, so uh, my construction would be a little different from what you just laid out. You used language that um, uh, had uh, um, verbs and adjectives and pronouns, which were uh, built within a logic structure of intention. <clears throat> and if I understand Matthias correctly, um, certainly, uh, for instance, in Mein Kampf, my understanding is Adolf Hitler um, and, and Joseph Goebbels have both in, in, in other communications have described the intentional creation of these uh, various conditions, although they didn't use the language of mass formation psychosis. But uh, my understanding of the current situation, my, my mental construct based on Matthias's teaching as I've tried to learn from, is that these conditions, these pre these um, uh, these pre-existing conditions were an emergent phenomena of social trends within broader global society. Those included the uh, social bond disassociation, which among other things uh, may be the consequence of various electronic media and devices that we've used, but all, probably also has other um, social uh, drivers. Um, he speak, he teaches of uh, the creation of free floating anxiety and the develop, not the creation, I'm using the wrong term, the emergent phenomena of free floating anxiety within a population or a fragment of the population, it doesn't have to be the whole population. He teaches it could be 30% uh, of the population, for instance, um, uh, develop this free floating anxiety. And uh, I, would, I would use the term angst. Uh, a, a sense of uh, not only social disconnect and free floating anxiety, but uh, various emotions along the spectrum, which includes anger. Um, uh, also a sense he speaks of, as I recall, of a sense of depersonalization. Um, so he teaches, at least to my ear, that there are a set of preconceived uh, social phenomena, which are to my eyes, often associated with periods of fairly rapid uh, social disruption. Um, and and uh, um, I think that social disruption and the failure of existing um, social uh, structure uh, solutions, such as existed in the French Revolution, prior to the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, and the conditions in Germany after the armistice. Uh, and I suggest that another exemplar may be considered to be um, the uh, um, events in the United States around the blacklisting for communism. Um, it, my sense, I, I haven't heard Matthias speak about this, McCarthyism. but my sense yes. is that just so McCarthyism would be another exemplar that might fit with Matthias's thinking that's more modern. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, my learning from Matthias is that these conditions existed uh, up in to the fourth quarter of 2019. And that uh, then there was a seminal event which focused the uh, entire world quite literally. I remember living through it online I was at the tip of it uh, because I got this call from Wuhan from a CIA officer on January 4th and, and I was active in social media. So I got to experience in the first person this obsessive uh, focusing that Matthias teaches about, which is uh, exactly analogous to the uh, focusing of an individual on an object, a uh, moving watch, a, a spiraling graphic, 
these various tools that are used to elicit a state of hypnosis. And Matthias teaches in my learning from him that this uh, formation of a hypnotic state by obsessive focusing after having these pre, uh, pre-existing conditions of depersonalization, anxiety, et cetera, um, <clears throat> creates the for, can create the formation of a common bond around a cohort of uh, the population that shares this obsessive focus on this event. And that when that occurs, they will identify with a leader and that once that leader is identified, that leader can do no harm, can do no foul. Anything that that leader says and can do because the leader is perceived as the source of resolution of their psychological pain, their anxiety and free floating. Um, and, and I'm persuaded, I'm gonna just editorialize. In my construct, um, uh, cognitive dissonance and psychological pain are probably the biggest motivators of human behavior, um, particularly in a, in a condition like this, that, the, that people will do extraordinary things to relieve uh, the psychological pain that they may, ex- may, may encounter from various situations, including cognitive dissonance. And my sense is that what Matthias is teaching us is a fundamental aspect of human psychology that has to do with relieving the pain of these uh, types of anxiety events um, and disassociation events. And so you have the formation of a mass. Each of the words that he teaches to us have meaning. They have intrinsic meaning and each one of them should be examined. The mass essentially, as I understand his teaching, consists of the crowd. That when he speaks of mass, it's kind of synonymous with crowd. And so the language crowd formation, in my mind, in, in North American lingo, is somewhat uh, more accessible to the general audience mm-hmm. than mass formation, which is more of a technical um, uh, psychiatric term. Uh, and, then, and then he speaks of the formation. That is this, uh, this uh, sudden cohesion of a group, um, a crowd, around this uh, set of events and this shared uh, consensus that um, this, there is something, there was a pre-existing sense of a failure of the normal world and, uh, and a particular event or, or ethnic group or other, uh, other you know, uh, I'm using that, uh, or some alternative other group or person, which becomes the focus of the attention and uh, is is perceived that that the suppression and rejection or killing of this alternative group, depending on which episode in history we talk about, becomes one of the focuses of of this leadership and of the mass, the crowd that is formed. And what I find most intriguing about his teaching is that this newly formed uh, crowd, which may be as small as a third of the cohort, with something like 30 to 40% of the cohort being in this intermediate space of kind of being a little bit passive, being brought along, um, not feeling uh, that they have to be invested in it, but it's too much hassle to uh, try to resist it. Um, so that, that cohort that is so formed will move through and uh, Stalin being the notable example, Matthias has this excellent uh, interview where he speaks about what happened under Stalinist Russia and how the, uh, the formed cohort uh, representing uh, Stalin's uh, Communist Party moved through extermination as documented by Solzhenitsyn and others mm-hmm. of both the, the enemy cohort and then having consumed it, turned on itself. Mm. And what he hasn't in, in, in consumed, I think he said 80 million, a large fraction of the total communist party in Russia was consumed by this psychosis and because they had basically run out of targets. There, there were not when really... he spoke about that, 
when he spoke about that, just to finish my thread, I'm sorry, Matthias, I, I look forward to your helping me get, get things more precise. I was reminded of the Jacobins post-French Revolution, where they turned on themselves and the guillotine started chopping off uh, members uh, that were not sufficiently pure, et cetera. Um, so uh, that's my summary of my understanding of his teaching. Now, please fix, me, fix what I got wrong. <laughs> Uh, I, I agree with pretty much everything you said, Robert. Uh, I would underline a few small differences, such as the fact and add some things, of course, uh, here and there. Uh, for instance, I, 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 I didn't use the term uh, mass formation psychosis. I prefer the term mass formation uh, because, in my opinion, as a Psychologist, as a clinical psychologist, you have to be very careful with using diagnostic terms because they can easily uh, have a stigmatizing meaning and they are both in an, in an ethical, in an ethical, from an ethical and also from a pragmatic pers uh, perspective, can they be a little bit counterproductive, I think. Um, so but, if uh, I can introduce to, to your point, I just had that discussion with Brett Weinstein half an hour ago. And he made exactly the same comment is that the term psychosis is inherently creating a barrier to uh, comprehension and acceptance of the theory by those that might be uh, threatened by the use of that term for exactly what you're saying. So thank you for that uh, reprimand and correction. Um, yes, but what, what, what is very accurate in your description, I think, or, or what, is, what, is very much, what is very much in line with how I have been trying to explain what happened is that it is predominantly an emergent phenomenon, as you call it. Uh, I guess you refer to complex dynamical systems theory, and uh, it is, in, 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 to a large extent, an, an unintentional phenomenon. And as you as you said, like we have seen mass formations and crowd formations uh, as long as mankind exists. Uh, but the strange thing is that throughout the last two or three centuries mass formation becomes increasingly strong and it lasts longer. And the masses become larger and larger, more and more people are involved in it. And by the end of the 19th century, um, uh, Gustave Le Bon, one of the major scholars on, on mass formation, uh, warned us already that if it continued like this, if the masses continue to increase uh, their strength and their, their capacity, then that we might soon um, um, witness uh, the emergence of a new state, a new type of state, which was based on the power of the masses, of the masses. And that's exactly what happened in the first half of the 20th century in, uh, in the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, which were one of the few ex historical examples of large scale mass formation. So I agree, like it, it's, a, it's an unintentional emergent phenomenon, uh, which became stronger um, uh, because the number of people who felt socially isolated uh, increased throughout the last three centuries. And this increase in the number of uh, socially isolated people was almost perfectly correlated to the uh, degree of uh, mechanization and industrialization in the country. So the more uh, um, uh, industrialization and the more people use, as you refer to, I think, uh, technological devices, uh, the more they feel socially isolated. This became, that's, that's, that's one of the major reason, reasons why uh, mass formation became increasingly strong uh, throughout the last gen, uh, centuries. And now uh, uh, what we noticed indeed just before the Corona crisis was that the number of socially isolated people was extremely high. For instance, the uh, U.S. Surgeon General talked about a, a loneliness epidemic, uh, and in Great Britain, a ministry, a, a minister of loneliness, was appointed by Theresa May because they acknowledged that uh, loneliness uh, was was a major uh, threat to the to um, to the health of people, and um, uh, under under these conditions, something very strange happens. Once. Or the or the the, the the loneliness is is actually the, the 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 number of socially isolated, socially atomized people, as Hannah Arendt calls it, is the is the central characteristic. And related to that, uh, there must be a, a lot of these are the four conditions that I that I described already a few times. I will, yes. Sh shall I repeat? Um, 
can you yeah. no 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 can you give a number i recall from one of your podcasts that that may, number may have been 60 percent in the u.s did i get yes. that right yes of 60 percent of the people uh, uh who reported that they had no meaningful relationships at all which is huge which, which is huge uh, and as a consequence and that's a second condition which is important as a consequence these people usually also feel a lack of meaning making in life lack of sense because human beings are really social beings and if the social bond is disrupted they typically experience their life as meaningless and that also was was really uh, 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 there were there were a lot of people for instance only in a, in a gallup world poll only 13 percent of the people reported that they uh, considered their jobs as really meaningful and 65 percent i think uh, reported that they uh, experienced their jobs as a completely meaningless. Uh, this is a phenomenon that is very well described in a book by David Graeber uh, called Bullshit Jobs. And then the third condition, also, which is also a consequence of the first two conditions, is that there, that there has to be a lot of free-floating anxiety. So anxiety that people cannot connect to a mental representation. And that's extremely important because if we know what we're anxious for, um, uh, um, we will not be as anxious as... Yes, it's, it's an it, it, the, 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 the situation in which someone is confronted with anxiety without knowing what he's anxious for is extremely aversive to a human being. So, and then the fourth condition is also a logical consequence of the first three conditions. It means that there has to be a lot of free floating frustration and aggression. People have to feel frustrated, aggressive without knowing what they are frustrated and aggressive for. And indeed, under these conditions, the population is sensitive to a very specific phenomenon. If under these conditions, a narrative is distributed through the mass media, indicating an object of anxiety, and at the same time, providing a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, something extremely strange happens in a society. All this free-floating anxiety attaches, connects to the object of anxiety presented in the narrative, and people are willing to participate in the strategy to deal with the object of anxiety. And that in itself leads to the most important uh, aspect of mass formation because everybody participates in the same strategy a new social bond emerges and people feel less isolated but in a symptomatic way because the new social bond and the new kind of meaning making is always destructive in nature and that's because of the fourth characteristic there was a lot of free-floating frustration and aggression and all this free-floating frustration and aggression is now directed at a specific group in the first place, the group who doesn't want to participate in the mass formation. And that's what we've seen time and time again uh, in the, throughout history, that mass formation has this destructive uh, characteristic. And in the end, also this, this destructive characteristic becomes self-destructive. Because once the enemy is destroyed, the mass formation won't stop because people know if the mass formation stops, they will be confronted again with all this free-floating anxiety, with all the frustration and aggression, with the lack of social bond and so on. So what they typically do in most cases, it's not necessarily like that, but in most cases, is they look for a new enemy, a new enemy which can be made the object of anxiety, which can be destroyed and so on. And that's why mass formation always ends up as a monster that divorces its own children. And that's a, a term that I um, borrowed from uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, a monster that divorces its own children. And what's so strange about the phenomenon is that because all this free-floating anxiety is connected to this mental representation of the object of anxiety, it seems as if the only part of reality that still exists is the object of anxiety and the strategy to deal with it. That's a, an extremely strange, remarkable aspect. And um, uh, that, that, in, that explains why it has the same psychological effects as hypnosis. Because in hypnosis, that's exactly what happens. Someone focuses the attention of someone else on one specific point of reality. And once he succeeds in doing this, it is as if the rest of reality does not exist anymore. To the extent that... In hospitals, this happens from time to time that people who are allergic to uh, chemical um, um, sedativa uh, are hypnotized to make them insensitive to, to pain. And it's really a simple 
hypnotic pro uh, procedure that is sufficient to focus the attention of someone so much on one aspect of reality that he won't feel that the surgeon starts to cut through the bone, through the, the skin, the, the flesh, eventually the, sometimes the bones. This, the focusing of attention is a really a, a, an extremely strong psychological uh, mechanism, which explains also that during mass formation, the leaders, the totalitarian leaders, can take everything away of people without them noticing it. It, that's one of the most remarkable aspects of the phenom phenomenon of mass formation. Um, and also, to I will add one more thing. Um, another characteristic of the phenomenon of mass formation is that the narrative that leads to the mass formation typically becomes more and more absurd. And the strange thing is that people don't seem to notice this. But actually, you can perfectly understand that once you understand that the reason why people buy into the narrative is not in the first place because the narrative is correct or scientific or, or, or accurate, the reason why people buy into the narrative is because it creates this new social bond. And that's why typically during mass formation, the people who don't want to conform to the masses, who, 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 who don't go along with the narrative, or typically approached that they lack citizenship and solidarity. So that shows what it is all about, the creation of a new social bond. People want to get rid of the feeling of social isolation, atomization, the free floating anxiety. That's why they buy into the story, even if it becomes utterly absurd. And that, and you could even go one step further, the more absurd the narrative is, and the more absurd the measures are, for instance, in the current situation, the more successful they will be for a certain part of the population, the part of, a, the, of the population that is really into the mass formation, because the measures have the function of a ritual. They have the function of a ritual through which an individual shows, by participating in the, in the, in the ritual, the individual shows that it is less important than the collective. And that's what ritualistic behavior has always been. A ritual is a kind of behavior which is without pragmatic meaning or sense, but which is, which is a symbolic kind of behavior through which an individual shows that it belongs to a collective and that it wants to sacrifice something of itself, which is important, in favor of the collective. So that's why we make this strange observation that no matter how absurd the measures are, they continue to receive a substantial support in a certain part, a major part of the population, which is usually about 30%. Um, uh, yeah. um, <clears throat> first of all, my manners, Dr. McCullough joined us. So I'll give it to him in a second. So Dr. McCullough, Dr. Desmet, Dr. Desmet, Dr. McCullough. Mm -hmm. Real quick, I was just I was just thinking because you know you're men you've you've mentioned twenties and thirties Germany. We've mentioned uh, the communist monster, right? You unleash the forest fire, and then you go, why is it only why is it not just attacking the trees I want gone? Then we talk about you know McCarthyism, but I was just thinking as you were saying that, it seems like you could almost turn the clock back twenty years. You could go the twin towers come down. We'd go to Afghanistan. Wait, why are we going to Iraq? Free floating anxiety. It's orange level. It's green level. It's, you know, there's anthrax. You got to go to the airport. TSA. Hey, NSA is going to start, you know, watching all your texts for the greater good. We're going to Iraq. Why are we going to Iraq? Shut up, communists. Don't you love America? And we bulldoze our way through there. And we have Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib. And we're doing all of this. And it's not until about 20 years later, we finally withdraw and we go, wait, what were we doing? But by the time we've withdrawn, we're already ready for the next one. But Dr. McCullough, I don't want to box you out. And I know we have you for uh, a finite amount of time. Your thoughts on all of this? Well, Tommy, thanks for having me on the show. It is a real honor to listen to Dr. Desmond and join Dr. Malone on your program. I was just on TV trying to explain to America these critical concepts. And I, I really want to hear from Dr. Malone about are we making any progress? And I give great credit to Dr. Matthias Desmet for teaching us these principles. I, I feel like I've sit in a psychology class right now. It's really good. But Dr. Malone, are we making any progress, do you think, in our messaging to Americans? Uh, well, thanks, Peter. I Again, I, I stand at the feet of the master. Um, 
uh, l learning learning from his teaching, but uh, I do feel like there has been some cracks in the narrative. Um, we've recently heard from the head of uh, the vaccine uh, leadership team in Great Britain that he, without saying the words Great Barrington Declaration, he basically rolled out the Great Barrington Declaration. I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, I think that uh, the world suddenly becoming fixated and obsessed with mass formation is a good sign. It's amazing. But Peter, here, I'm going to turn it back on you. I know you're a deeply religious person. And I, I am not, although I was raised an Episcopalian with all of the trimming. So that's the closest thing you can get to uh, the Catholic Church, I think. Um, and uh, I am struck at this moment that one of the positive constructive things that religion and religious communities give is uh, something that I speculate may be protective uh, to, to the formation of this type of event. That uh, is that part of Matthias has taught us that there's the arc of history suggesting that we are seeing the gradual um, increasing, uh, it's, I'm gonna use words that he didn't say severity of mass formation over time being, time being you know, century time. Uh, and, um, and I'm struck intuitively that the time frame that he's speaking of is one that has paralleled the gradual erosion of the uh, role of communities of faith in our society. And um, because of your leadership and commitment in Richard Erso's and many others that are uh, um, uh, within this uh, community framework, broadly written, um, it is, I'm, I've been struck in this journey that the leaders that are um, at the forefront trying to bring us out of this um, come from uh, devout uh, communities uh, committed to, I'm sorry, I'm not making, I'm not casting aspersions on Muslims or any other group, but, but a uh, Christian cohort. And yet I also visited the Vatican, as you may recall, and met with Cardinal Turkson, uh, another deeply uh, committed religious leader who had the mission space of uh, COVID response for the Vatican, who has just resigned from the Vatican. I mean, I, it boggles my mind. Many people thought he was number two to the Pope. He has resigned. He's no longer in the Vatican because uh, Pope Francis' leadership uh, was not uh, comfortable with questioning um, uh, what I would call, based on Matthias' teaching, the mass formation. Over. <laughs> that, that's a very interesting observation. I, you know, I've said many times there's about 500 doctors trying to treat all of America with COVID-19, about a million doctors on the sideline. The unique characteristic about the 500 doctors, we know each other pretty well now, is almost exclusively they're practicing uh, Christians or practicing Jews. Now, that's just our Western society. I, I don't have a sense for other religions. I have had interactions with almost all the major denominations in Christianity through my journey and uh, realize at the top, uh, all are in sync with mass formation, but there are large units uh, beneath the uh, upper layers that are awake and their eyes are clear and their ears they can hear. You know, I just did a television program uh, in Lahore, Pakistan, and for the first time had a chance to, uh, you know, interact with uh, Hindu Muslim communities. And I, I just haven't had the, I used to travel all the time academically. And for the last two years now, I haven't traveled. So I haven't had that interaction. So I can't speak to it. Uh, but whatever's going on is obviously worldwide. I've been impressed with how the behaviors are the same in the most remote parts of the world. Even, peop even people who are not connected to Twitter, they don't even know what Gates Foundation is or Gabby. Uh, the same thinking is on the tiniest islands of Indonesia, the deepest forests of South America, as it is in New York City. 
So I'm interested in Dr. Desmond's idea of how can mass formation, in a sense, almost travel from mind to mind without direct communication? It almost seems like it's supernatural. Yeah, that's, that's true. And that has been described from the earliest scientific studies on mass formation. They call it, um, well, uh, thoughts and, 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 and words are contagious uh, 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 when a phenomenon of mass formation emerges. It's a very strange thing. Also, it almost seems someone like Canetti has described this in a book called um, The Crowd and Power or something. I don't know. That's Elias Kennedy. It's a, it's a, it's a writer who, who who wrote a book on, on mass formation, and he also describes that if you look how uh, how masses when they masses when or a crowd when they when it physically uh, emerges when it physically comes together in a city, for instance, how exactly it emerges? It's it's very strange because people seem to feel they seem to feel attracted in a strange way to one spot in the city, and it's very hard to explain how. Uh, 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 the crowd uh, actually uh, comes into being, and you, you see the same phenomenon 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 in uh, starlings when when in starling swarms. When a starling swarm emerges, it's strange, but all the individual starlings seems to feel that the swarm is emerging, and they all join the swarm. And more or less the same happens when a crowd forms, when a physical crowd forms, but also at the more the mental psychological level. This has been described time and time again in a strange way. People start to think all people start to think in the same way. They all start to think in the same way. They even start to use the same words, uh, and it happens extremely fast, with the speed of the lightning. It happens extremely fast. It's very hard to explain, as as a lot of aspects of complex dynamical systems are hard to explain uh, uh, in in more or less ordinary terms. Uh, I have no idea, actually. Uh, you can try to explain it. Of course, people identify with each other, and you can describe this more or less at a psychological level. It's not easy, but you can. But even then, uh, uh, it remains hard to, to explain how it can go, how uh, things can happen so fast, how why people start to share the same beliefs, the same thoughts, the same words uh, 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 in such a, uh, a short amount of time. Um, um, yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a very well-known phenomenon. That's, that's uh, uh, one thing that I can say. And you, of course, you could, you could try to refer to more uh, exotic thinkers such as Rupert Sheldrake, who explained that when, when, people, when, when several people start to think in the same way, uh, the, 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 the ideas and the thoughts uh, spread uh, in a kind of a morphogenetic field uh, and people all get connected to this field, okay. Then, then you have to use, uh, as I said, a very ex exotic uh, uh, theoretical framework. But sometimes it seems that it is almost the only thing uh, that can explain what happens uh, uh, throughout the process of mass formation. Um, now, Dr. Desmet, what, what are the characteristics of those who resist the mass formation? It just doesn't make sense to them. They, they seem to feel so completely different. Uh, that group seems to develop, a, it's small, typically uh, the smaller group, the minority is those who don't uh, join the formation, uh, but, but they also seem to be galvanized and cohesive. What's your viewpoint? Well, uh, that's also a very good question because it it's always has been a question as to why a small part of the population defies the, the crowd. And so it's... it's, 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 it's Two, two things has, has always have always been remarked. One, the group who defies the crowd, who, who does not go alone, uh, in, in the in the narrative with the narrative that uh, that leads to the mass formation, is always very heterogeneous. Uh, it, it comes from all kinds of political backgrounds, all kinds of socioeconomic status, all kinds of um, uh, uh, professional backgrounds. It's very hard to to define them. Uh, to, 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 to find something that this group has in common. Uh, it's probably, uh, it can be explained or probably the reason why some people uh, do not buy into the, the, the narrative or, or do not, uh, um, or are not grasped by the process of mass formation probably has to be explained on the basis of such characteristics that can only be defined at the level of indiv individual uh, psychology. For instance, if you look at, there are different personality structures, and these personality structures are, are all based 
on different mechanisms to find stability at a psychological level. And some people typically will uh, look for stability or will try to find stability by identifying with um, uh, certain ideal images that circulate in a society. And other people will much more try to find their stability by something that people as Foucault, but also the ancient Greeks called truth speech. And so these people always try to take a rational stance. They try to think critically about um, uh, mainstream narratives, about dominant narratives, about these narratives that are, that are accepted by everybody. And they find a certain stability by always trying to speak out uh, in an as truthful and in as, in, in an as sincere and, 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 uh, and honest way. So that's that at the level of individual uh, 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 personality structures, you can clearly differentiate between personal, personalities that uh, are based, that look for stability in the one direction or the other. And it's probably the case that it are these people that, that do not look for stability in, uh, in commonly shared ideals or ideal images uh, or, or, or shared narratives uh, that defy the masses. But of course, that doesn't explain everything. It's every time again, almost every major scholar such as Gustav Le Bon, uh, Sigmund Freud, Canetti, uh, Hannah Arendt, they all have stressed time and time again how hard it is to understand why and what uh, uh, defines what what uh, um, what characteristics are shared by the group uh, who doesn't um, uh, who is not uh, into the process of mass formation? It's very hard to define. It's, it's extremely heterogeneous. Yes, Robert. Uh, Matthias, would Socrates be uh, a prototype example of the uh, that sub cohort that you just described? Can you come again, Robert? What? How did you the, call it? The Greek, the Greek, the Greek philosopher Socrates. Oh, you yes. Just described, yeah, right. You, you. I think what I just heard you say, in other words, was that those that per, that perceive the world through the intellectual framework of the Socratic method mm -hmm. are aligned with one sub cohort of these that are less susceptible. But you previously taught, as I recall, that often intelligent, highly intelligent people are as susceptible or more susceptible to the mass formation than yep. the average person. But I'm, yes. the reason why I'm asking this thread is in our own, in, in our own example, um, there are some exceptionally accomplished academics, Peter being an example. Um, and uh, they, for some reason, uh, particularly this cohort that has been at the forefront of early treatment, um, if you look at them, these are extremely well-trained, um, highly accomplished physicians um, that, that have not been susceptible and I wonder if the, if the parallelism here, the cause and effect, is that these guys, in, I'm shouldn't be gender specific, I'm just using that in general, those that have this uh, spectrum of, of behaviors and psychologies that have been so successful as academics, maybe part of what made, has made them successful is that they think in this way that the common slang is out of the box in, in which they are constantly questioning the dominant narrative. Over. Mm -hmm. Well, there is, one thing is, is, is clear, and it is that the higher the level of, of education, the more susceptible or the more vulnerable people usually are for mass formation in general. And so that's something surprising, uh, uh, but but um, uh, and you can also try to explain that from a psychological point of view. But Gustave Le Bon mentioned it, Hannah Arendt mentioned it, almost everybody mentioned it that has been studying mass formation. The, the higher the level of education, usually the more vulnerable for mass formation. So, so, so Peter and I are constantly subjected to the question, what the heck is going on with all your physician peers? Yes, yes. You, you may have just given us the key to that lock. Yes, I also think that the people who strive, who try to, to get a high degree or something, that maybe are typically or usually people who think that 
uh, social status is very important. And, and, and that could be the reason why they, they are uh, inclined to conform uh, uh, with the mainstream narrative. Um, I don't know, that's one possible explanation. But also your reference to Socrates, I think, is very important because indeed the ancient Greeks had a, had a term uh, um, which was parisia. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. Parisia, the courage to speak the truth. <laughs> so they, 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 they felt like a society could not function well if there were not enough people who had the courage to speak the truth. So they called it parisia. Uh, um, um, and um, I think it's exactly this characteristic, the courage to, to try to speak the truth, that uh, is probably one of the major characteristics that is important uh, if you uh, don't want to fall prey uh, to mass formation. Uh, if you just... But, but, but what happened to Socrates, of course, was the hemlock. Uh, yes. <laughs> it was hemlock, one of the earlier examples of uh, a victim of mass formation. Cancel culture. <laughs> 2000 years yes. ago of course the greeks knew already that speaking the truth is, is extremely dangerous because the truth is always that part um, of knowledge that is in conflict or at contrast with uh, the dominant narrative that's something hegel say uh, he hegel also said the, the german philosopher and the greeks knew that the person who tries to speak the truth who tries to show uh, uh, who tries to, who tries to reveal uh, that knowledge uh, that is in conflict with the, with the mainstream narrative, uh, this person puts himself at risk. Uh, but if there are no such people anymore, then society cannot function. <laughs> and so, yes, of course, uh, everybody who, who, who does his best to try to say something of which he thinks it, it, it is true, but in conflict with uh, the dominant narrative, puts himself at risk, but at the same time, he maybe does what is most necessary uh, to preserve a certain level of humanity and society. Um, yeah, you can you can see that with Galileo, with Bruno, or even more recently, you can see it with Joseph Lister. I mean, if you replaced, we've always talked about how you could uh, replace the term Jew with unvaccinated and just get a peer into the past. I mean, you could replace. Uh, ivermectin with phenol or carboxylic acid and you get you can get to know joseph lister i mean all the same thing there's a great book by lindsey fitzharris um but they talk about how they would bring him in and they say hey we'd love to have you here we know you're one of the most you know the most uh, accomplished doctors in the world just don't use your your antiseptic technique we don't want to hear about it everyone knows germs aren't real but i mean you can just replace ivermectin with there and it's the same thing and it's we don't want a part of you and just like galileo or bruno uh lister actually got to live to see it but towards the end of his life everyone started coming around and they went you know they looked at the civil war and they go you know when these guys have these huge wounds in their legs and we're packing it with dirt and they're all dying and then Lister comes along and it's like, hey, just put a little alcohol on it. And then they live for 30 more years. You can see that it's not for nothing because it echoes through the centuries where you can look back and you go, I'm not crazy because all these guys thought they were crazy and they stuck with it. And now we look back to them and we hold them up. We go, they, they stood for the truth. And that is how society continues to function. It's really beautiful. You only need one. You just need one. And society moves forward. And you have to do that. And that's the only way that mass formation psychosis seems like it can cloud the whole globe, but eventually the truth comes through and then it shines there like a light. And then you go over the horizon and you can kind of see that light. And then you stand up for your truth. And then another century goes by and you can look back and you see one little truth, but that's really all you need to keep society moving forward. So as long as one I'm, person stands up, Dr. Malone. I'm reminded of the saying from your lips to God's ears and uh, the forward looking hope that Peter and I aren't forced to drink the hemlock because uh, because metaphorically we already kind of well, are. Uh, <laughs> well, that, that's that's kind of the other part of this uh, feel good analogy is guys like you and Rogan and I suppose myself for having you guys on. That's kind of the other part. That's the fine print. You all die, you know, so, you know, <laughs> it's uh... um, well, just so uh, that's so. You know, the, the, uh, who is John Galt is my spirit animal, I think, these days, uh, if you know Atlas Shrugged. But I only have nine minutes left. Mm -hmm. Tommy, would it be okay if Matthias spoke to us about his prescription? 
Absolutely. Or, uh, Absolutely. How do we get out of this? Absolutely. That's, I, I, would, I would love to learn from his prescription. He has said that we could refocus the mall on global totalitarianism at our risk. Um, and then I'd, if he has time, I'd like to learn about the specific nuance of how this relates to children. Um, but uh, then I, I want to shut up now and, and let Peter and, and, and Matthias have the floor over. Dr. Desmond. Yes, well, once you understand the nature of uh, the process of mass formation, you also understand what you can do about it. But that doesn't mean that it is, that it is easy to do something about it. And so the process of mass formation is a, you know, it's a kind of hypnosis. And uh, most scholars agree that it is very hard uh, to wake people up from, from, from such a, a state of, 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 of mass formation. But what, so mass formation is a phenomenon that is provoked by a voice. It's, it's a voice of a leader, the voice, a voice that is distributed time and time again through the mass media uh, that keeps people in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a process of mass formation. And the leader himself is also grasped in this process of mass formation. This is so typical for this process that uh, both the hypnotist and the hypnotized are into the process. Um, um, name, the, and, name the leader. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. Name the leader. Name the leader? The, in, that case, in this case, the leaders are the, are the experts. Right? It's, it's clear that, that, that the authority and the, uh, uh, is situated now in, 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 in the experts and the technocrats, you could say. Uh, so that these people are pronouncing time and time again the narrative in the mass media, and they believe in the underlying ideology, usually, but very often they don't believe in the exact narrative that they, that they distribute. Uh, usually they are so fanatically uh, convinced that uh, their ideology is what will save the world, that they feel that it is justified to manipulate a little bit, to lie a little bit, uh, just to, to, to convince is, people. So this is Plato's noble lie. Did, can you come what again? You just described. This is Plato's yeah. noble lie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so, but it is the voice of the leader that keeps the people in the, into the hypnosis. And once you understand that, you understand that if you want to make the, 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 the mass formation less deep, then it is quintessential that there are people who continue to speak out and to continue who voice a dissonant voice in society, because this will disrupt the process of mass formation. That is the most basic and the most important uh, thing we can do. In the first place, we have to continue to speak out. In the second place, we have to connect in the real world, in small circles that overlap a little bit, forming networks with people vaccinated and unvaccinated. It's not important, but just try to connect in the real world with people who have the feeling that something is wrong. So, and then uh, the, in the next step, so it's very important if we try to convince people, if we try to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, 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 bring a different narrative, it's extremely important that we do not try to convince people to go back to the old normal, because the old normal what was what people tried to escape through the process of mass formation. It was exactly because the old normal was unbearable that people were sensitive to the process of mass formation. Thus, what we should try to construct together is a new normal, but, but which is not a technocratic or a transhumanist new normal. We should show people that there are other options. There are other options to escape the old normal uh, than uh, a technocratic transhumanist uh, 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 new normal. So I think these three things are extremely important. We have to continue to speak out. That's the most important thing. Then we have to try to connect and we have to construct a, a, a narrative altogether a new normal showing people that there are other options to escape the old normal as soon as we understand that i think we can start to become successful because what i often hear now is that the people who refuse to go along with the mainstream narrative that they actually always try to convince the people to go back to the old normal and that's that, that, that's from a psychological point of view that's absurd and then the last important thing i i, I believe is that um if we try to resist, if we try to defy what's happening now, then we should stick to the principles of non-violent resistance, because that's 
by far the most efficient uh, strategy. Because once you start to think about, once you become aggressive, even only in the way you speak, then you will justify for the masses yeah. to, to, to channel and to, 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 to direct all this frustration and aggression at the dissonant voice. Because that's one of the major characteristics of mass formation is that people become radically intolerant for dissonant voices. And of course, that's because the dissonant voices threaten to wake up the masses. And in that case, the masses are confronted again with the, with the free-floating anxiety and so on. Uh, so people are usually radically uh, intolerant for dissonant voices. And every sign of aggression from the group who, uh, uh, who does not go along with the masses justifies uh, uh, the, 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 that the masses commit atrocities. Sometimes they are always inclined to. So that's the, my four, if I should... If I have to put it in a very concise way, continue to speak out, try to connect, think about the new normal, which is different from uh, the new normal that led to the mass formation, and always stick to the to the principles of nonviolent resistance. But do it in a in a in a in a in a convinced way. We we should not hesitate. Um, yeah. Yes, it, yeah, it's because if you provide if you do that violence, you're providing them with the Reichstag fire. You're providing them with the Gulf of Tonkin to which now they can justify their hammer. And I know we got three minutes left. I want to touch on uh, real quick what Dr. Malone said, listening on Rogan, quoting Matthias is, or not quoting, talking about is once we realize that there's this mass formation psychosis, kind of this global lockstep, if you replace that, that's just one next level up. And now the same thing can happen. Someone can come in and go, there is a global takeover, follow me. And now we're right back at step one. So it's we can't do we can't replace oxycotton with suboxone and then replace that with beer we're still just moving from drug to drug to drug we've got to get sober and you just have to speak your truth don't don't look around and don't look at what everyone else is saying what do you know to be true and follow that that's the only way we're going to get out of this we're in a movie theater right now we all need to just flip the lights on and go hey we can't go to another movie we got to walk out of the theater and go see the sunlight dr malone what I just heard, uh, the prescription uh, from Dr. Desmet, uh, is that Peter and I are morally obligated yes. because for better or for worse, many people seem to identify us as the tip of the spear in this case. Um, I haven't sought it. I know he hasn't sought it, but here it is. We, we, what, what I think Matthias is teaching is that we have a moral obligation uh, to continue on this track, recognizing the, the risk that we may be forced to drink the hemlock. But we're locked into this. We must keep doing it. We have no choice. And yes, we sir. have to do it with an open heart. I mean, basically, we, I, the only metaphors that I find that help me in this journey. And I said before, recognize I am not inherently a Christian person, even though I was raised in a church, a Christian church practice. But the metaphor of Jesus and the disciples seems to be, not that we're Jesus, don't even sure. begin to misinterpret it, but that idea of open-hearted um, uh, leadership uh, despite, but with, with, I mean, the story of Jesus is one of self-awareness of what the end point was, um, right? That's, Peter knows the, the scripture better than I do by far, but it's, it's a story of, of a leader in a mass formation environment, um, trying to point the way to a, a different way forward in time with an open heart, knowing full well what the end game was and yet still proceeding and it, it feels to me like that's what Matthias is teaching to us is that Peter and I and our colleagues are locked into this and there is only we're now at a point where there's only one road forward and we got to walk it. it it is and I would also say Dr. McCall and Dr. Malone you both have an obligation now that you've been on there to get Matthias on Joe Rogan I think that's your obligation as well, is we need to get the master. Beyond Wasn't the he on? I thought he had been, were you, were I thought you? he'd been on Rogan. Am I an idiot? Were you? No, 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 no. I wasn't. Dr. Okay. Malone and Dr. McCall, you guys got to make that happen. 
if in in Matthias, I put it in the sidebar. Um, if you're interested, I would love to have you in Miami next week, but I have to jump. I'll I'll put you guys in contact via email. Matthias Desmond, Dr. Matthias Desmond, Dr. Robert Malone, Dr. Peter McCullough. Thank you so much. Keep doing the right thing. Everyone listening to this, do your part. Share this. Don't be violent. Open your heart. We it's either the Great Awakening or the Great Reset. We have one or the other. Follow your heart. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Take care. God bless everyone.